Welcome to Face the Book, the new community media magazine that looks through the eyes of authors, independent publishers, booksellers, and readers around New England. Face the Book takes you inside bookshops, coffee shops, print shops, and libraries. We're looking on book clubs, bookshelves, and any place else where people are writing, making, selling, or reading books. At Face the Book, we dive boldly into the swirl of new media in this age of the Kindle, mega bookstores, microblogging, cloud computing, and Amazon. Best of all, Face the Book helps you discover exciting new independently published books and maybe publish your own. I'm Mike Bulio, your moderator of this episode of Face the Book. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what would a library be without physical books? Is that something we'll see one day? Is it already happening? Today on Face the Book, we're discussing the role of libraries and librarians in the internet age, in both the public library and school sectors. We're joined in the studio by Robert Mayer, director of the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, freelance researcher Risa Sachs, and Framingham State College librarian uh, Millie Gonzalez. Welcome, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great to be here. Oh, and we're also joined. Uh, right. And we're also joined by Beverly Shank, assistant director of the Watertown Public Library. Uh, and uh, she'll be joining us via Skype. Um, so uh, it will be seamless integration into the show which for the first time, which is exciting. And we're happy to have Beverly with us. Um, so we were talking a little bit uh, before the show about uh, sort of how the library has changed in all of our lives and. Uh, um, you know, the, the very the concept of a library without books and sort of how the roles of libraries have changed. Um, so, Rob, I'll start with you. One of the things you've pointed out before the, when we we're talking was that um, library use is up uh, significantly over the past <coughs> 10 years. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that circulation, that kind of thing. Sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> you know, we talk about libraries in the Internet age, and if you think about the last 10 years, well, that's pretty much the internet age. So in Massachusetts, during the last 10 years, every single year, public library circulation, the checking out of all those materials, has hit an all-time high every single year, 10 years in a row. So people are using their libraries more than ever. Um, and do you feel that, um, do you have a, a sense of the percentage of the materials? As, you know, has it slowly swayed from books to videos? and things like that, or has it stayed? Uh... <clears throat> well, clearly there's a change. Um, book circulation is pretty static during that period of time. Um, so you could say that most of the increase is attributable to media, um, CDs, very popular, um, DVDs, and audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the real growth areas. But I think it's important to note that book circulation has not sort of d dived off the end. Right. Uh, it's pretty stable throughout that period of time. Um, and I'm actually going to just uh, go to Beverly for just a moment. Um, you know, being at the library on a daily basis, um, how have you seen that change, the sort of the patron coming off the street? How have you seen their visits change over the years, and sort of where is it right now? I can speak very specifically to some of the stuff that Rob was talking about. In the last fiscal year, our uh, increase in circulation went up 14.5%. Although some of it has to do with the economy and people using libraries more, but all in all, I think it shows the increase he's talking about. We typically have about 60% of our circulation books and 40% or even a little more in uh, the other formats, all of the, the CDs and videos, that type of thing, Xbox games, all of that. What the average person coming in off the street because the formats are so different, they're asking for different things than they did 20, 30 years ago. But the basic information needs, leisure reading needs, um, music needs, they're the same. And um, uh, this is something that uh, we also, that I talked to Rob about a little bit, um, sort of how the role of the librarian has changed um, from, uh, you know, sort of, because it's become more of a research assistant, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, That's right. Librarians have always been good at helping the people figure out really what the best resources, the best answers to their questions. They've been good at teasing out what the real information or reader needs are of the people. They'll, often people will come in voicing one, one question of some kind, and as you as you talk to people, turn it around a little bit, you can really tease out what they really want, and it isn't necessarily what the first question was. So those skills are still there and still useful, even if 
what you're doing is helping somebody who's just done a Google search understand that what pops up on Google first isn't necessarily the best stuff to use for whatever their question was. Uh, and I want to segue from that, actually, to, um, to Millie. You deal with perhaps the most confused segment of the population, college <laughs> students. Um, That's an interesting way to... <laughs> oh, I don't know if I would Speaking say that, but... <laughs> right. but... But I wonder if Beverly's statements rang true about sort of teasing out what people actually need. I mean, especially, I think, in a researching role, you must run into that a lot. Well, I think, uh, um, first of all, uh, we need to build relationships in a lot of times... Um, being welcoming, that's the first step, because a lot of times they would rather sometimes either I am or text me first, right. and then when they find out that uh, we're actually, we can actually help them and we're approachable, then they're more inclined to come to me. Um, and so definitely, uh, because I work in an academic library, it's more research focused, but, um, but working in a library, it's so much more than just either books or doing research, it's more providing services that they really want. Um, so it's, it's definitely an exciting time to be a librarian and be working in libraries. Um, and do you feel that your role has changed? Like if you think back, um, you know, five or ten years ago in terms of, you know, that, that service aspect of it? Um. Well, the thing is, um, you know, before I became a librarian, I had sort of uh, preconceptions on what a librarian would be like, you know. Um, and it was not necessarily positive, um, not because I didn't, I didn't, you know, I've always loved being in libraries, but I just sort of wanted to do things on my own. And now I realize how much better it is if you actually interact with a library. <laughs> um, you know, you, can, you, you find out um, all of the hidden treasures that you might have not discovered. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, you know, the way that um, I deal with um, um, uh, the students or faculty or anyone who comes to me, it's, um, it's really sort of the same, sort of the traditional reference skills. Um, what do you want? Just probing uh, questions. The method, the questions, the way that I approach it is different. So I can sit down with you and set an appointment for an hour. I can, sometimes I have five minutes, sometimes I just have a quick I am. So that has changed. Um, so now you're available by electronic means to provide information. We, we provide services in whatever way that the students and faculty feel comfortable. That's great. I mean, just from an adaptation standpoint, it's really sort of, it's great that you guys are, can be available that way, because I think that makes it that much more accessible to the students. Oh, it is. And I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's fun for us, because it's another way of reaching students yes. um, where they want us to be. Mm -hmm. And Risa, you're a freelance researcher. Yes. And, um, you know, uh, obviously the library is a huge part of doing research, but the internet has become a bigger part of that. Um, so how do you feel that the library fits into your uh, general role? When we were talking earlier, I talked about having really three, three legs to a, a, an information stool, one being people and the information inside their heads, Another being the printed. Oh, yeah, that's my. There I am. Another being the printed, as you can see. Another being the printed, the printed book or printed material, and the third one being the electronic media. And I think that no solution is complete without all three legs. You've got a wobbly stool without yeah. all three legs, um, and it's you use them all in a very iterative. Um, interactive manner. You might start online and read an article about a topic, and at the end of that article there might be reference books that you would only find in the library. There might also be people quoted in the article that you'd then want to call, or you might then go to the library to find additional information about that person, additional things they've written. So it's, it's a, as I said, it's an iterative process where each thing leads you to another piece of the puzzle. And it's also the information right, right now. It's wonderful, but it's vast. It's, yes. it's, you know, it's so confusing so that I think right. that's where we come in. We can actually make it a lot more simple. Right. They, they actually they speak of today as getting information is trying to drink out of the end of a fire hose. <laughs> it's not that you don't have enough information. It's that you're so you're overwhelmed, you're so overwhelmed with right. information. So that's the role true. of information professionals is to act as that filter, to help you act as that filter, as you were talking about the, the interviewing people to find out what they really need. That reference interview is the same thing in, in 
whether you're a professional researcher or a librarian or whatever you do, it's that it's that winnowing down, that finding what's really needed so that you can find the best sources of information, which might be the library, might be online, right. might be a person. So what um, Risa and Millie and Beverly have been saying is that it's really about the relationship between the librarian yeah. and the user, the mm -hmm. customer, figuring out what that customer really needs and wants, and then matching that need against the resources that you have at hand. And what Risa is describing is the fact that we have so many more resources now right. to bring to bear to help to um, find what our users actually need. But it's that basic relationship that's always been at the heart of what libraries do, regardless yeah. of what kind of library it is. It's interesting, you know, exactly that, that point. I'm hearing you guys all talk about it. It's like, you know, people say, oh, it must have changed so much, but in fact, it's almost enhanced exactly what it's always been about. Exactly. Uh -huh. but, the, but I think, you know, everything, a, a lot of stuff is online. Yeah. So we have to sort of make everything available easy to find for those who prefer to find it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's that very whole, different. Whole relationship and trust idea that's been coming out that how that is important in communities in a public library like oh. mine, what we're best at is really deep into local issues, local history, local events, providing information about our community. No other institution in the community, including now the newspapers, which used to do it, but don't anymore on the level that's, that's really weighed down deep. We can provide that kind of stuff, and we have wonderful electronic tools uh, Wikipedia and all kinds of models like that that can carry this information that we've dug up and be very interactive. We've built a sort of trust and relationship with all the people in our community to provide us that kind of thing and to take advantage of what we provide. I think communities probably in public school libraries or in school libraries and also in colleges and that kind of thing also exist on that, that sort of level. Yeah, we, talk, we were talking earlier again about the role of the library from its very earliest days as being a community center, a place where people in the community could come together. Um, and I think that, that that role has stayed throughout, throughout all of the changes in the media and the, the sources, that sense of being a community place um, and, and a center. Has, has really retained. But, but for my job, I, I have to sort of recreate that in the vir virtually as well. Mm -hmm. So I manage yeah. the website and the portal and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's, it's definitely much of a community. Yeah. Well, and we're also seeing libraries, in a sense, becoming publishers. Um, so at Beverly's Library in Watertown, um, they have a wonderful collection of historic photographs uh, of, the, of the town which several years ago they digitized and put on their website. So they've made this information uh, available not just in the library, but to any user, in fact, anywhere in the world. Uh, and many libraries are doing much the same thing. Um, and many libraries want to do more of that, but just lack the funds right now right. to really do it. Uh, but that will all come along, because all of our libraries have unique resources that they are the custodians of. They don't just want to be custodians. Um, we want to get this information out to people, and the internet gives us a great tool to do that. Absolutely true. Whenever I'm doing a research project that deals with a local, a local issue or a local place, wherever it is in the country, well, in the world, but certainly in the country, my first stop is frequently the local librarian, because it, exactly they are the custodians of the community, the history. History, right. yeah. You're the keepers of the flame. So. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, you know, what's interesting, uh, just touching on the internet, sort of, and the, the, you know, when the internet started to really pick up steam, people were saying, "Oh, well, it's going to isolate us all. We're all going to be, you know, shut-ins and playing, um, uh, you know, video games and never talk to anybody." But you know, the opposite is true, and it's sort of the library is a microcosm of that. Sort of, you need someone to help you make sense of the fire hose of information. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead of isolating us all, it sort of brought us together um, 
to come to the library where you run into people you know and you come to talk to the librarian and ask exactly. for things. I mean, that must happen at the campus a lot. People, you know, kids come into the library thinking it's going to be a big, you know, horrible process, but then they run into their friend, they chat with them for a few minutes, then they meet with you mm -hmm. and have a great experience where they find the information they need. They grab a cup of coffee. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, it does become that sort of uh, center. Um, and, uh, you know, something else that's interesting you know, is that, you know, again with the public libraries, is that they have subscriptions to all these uh, tools, which Beverly touched on a little bit. Um, you know, subscriptions that the normal person either can't or couldn't afford, either, you know, can't get access to or couldn't afford to get access to um, with amazing information. Um, or the state, uh, they don't, they're not aware that the state provides all of this mm -hmm. wonderful free resources. Right. Right. That uh, they can even access from their from home. home. Right. Right. Yeah. Their library card. I mean, so your library card both the library, the physical library itself, but also being in the com the virtual community of the library opens new worlds to you. It does. So the internet is actually a delivery mechanism yeah. that libraries can use to bring information to um, their users right. any time of the day or night. Yeah. And that's part of what we're about as a state agency. One of the things we're trying to work toward is equity of access to the resources. So right here in the metro boston area is one of the greatest concentrations of library holdings in the world not just in the united states in the world when you think about harvard mit boston public library the sixth largest research library in the country um, so the closer you are to boston in theory the more access you have now you can't get into all those places um, but as you move farther west in massachusetts as you go away from boston your access is diminished. So what we're trying to do is use the internet as a delivery mechanism right. to bring resources to people regardless of where they are in the state. And it's very successful. Mm -hmm. It is. Absolutely. Um, now, um, you know, there's, uh, speaking of that delivery mechanism, there's uh, an interesting thing happening at uh, Cushing Academy. Um, and what they're doing is they're uh, basically getting rid of all their books and um, they're moving to sort of what looked to me like a, an internet research <coughs> lounge um, for high school students. Uh, and, you know, to me, I, as a bookstore owner, I was aghast at the thought of <laughs> that. Um, and I wonder if, you know, if that can be practical, sort of, if, um, you know, you think about the library in that role of being a paperless thing, sort of where is that in your mind in the future? Well, I mean, I think that uh, not everything looks good in sort of like a Kindle type format, you know. So I think in the future, I think we're gonna we might see sort of a hybrid of what we have now to what the Cushing Academy is. You know, there I I strongly believe that people love books in its original format, but I also think in certain certain instances, it's a lot easier to to view. Um, to read a book on a Kindle or an iPod Touch or whatever, um, and, and and that's that's wonderful. So I don't see it necessarily as bad. Um, but for my my point of view is that uh, we have to make sure that the um, that the users have privacy, um, and I think that's that's what libraries stand for: that users have their privacy, that nobody will check in and you know snoop around. Um, and, and that, I think, is a big concern. You know, that's an interesting point, actually. And we sort of talked about amplifying what the library does and how it brings people together and helps them get information. But sort of if you take away the books and the circulation for just a second, um, sort of what is the, the basis of a library? What's the true definition of a library? And, you know, the privacy of access um, Well, is first is providing access. Right. Mm -hmm. Preservation of, yeah. of historical materials, um, enabling access, and then, you know, and also protecting the, the privacy. Um, so it's interesting um, that, uh, you know, that those, that those three pieces are true no matter what the material is, whether it's, you know, bits of data or pieces of paper or, you know, plastic uh, or vinyl discs. Um, um, I think part of the joy of it is it's not an either or. It doesn't have to be an either or solution. It doesn't have to be electronic or paper. I think there's a place for all the different things going forward. I think there's a, a certain 
joy, and we're saying maybe we all feel like dinosaurs, but there's a certain joy in paging through something and, and opening the pages and turning the pages of a book or when you're doing research by serendipity, as it were. You know, your fingers are walking through something, you'll find something you never would have thought to, to ask for before because all of a sudden there it is as you turn the page. So. I, I went to a library in, in, in Rhode Island where there was a piano room. So I think, you know, um, I, I thought that was wonderful. So I think, you know, libraries are not all about books. It's about a lot of different things. Yeah. Well, libraries are a, a community center. Yeah. Right. Um, always have been community centers. But I think more and more um, people are turning to their libraries looking for that sort of third place idea. It's not your home. It's not where you work. It's that other place that you enjoy being. You're comfortable there. You feel fulfilled there. And libraries are, are playing that role in their communities. Art exhibits, concerts, book talks. Education. Classes. Education, classes. Um, and then the, the whole thing that's really um, come our way in libraries in the last couple of years with uh, the difficult economy um, people are going to their libraries looking for jobs. Right. They're getting help writing resumes. They're getting help developing their interview skills. They might be getting an email account for the first time yeah. and learning how to use it, learning how to apply for uh, a position online right. when they've never had to do that before. So libraries have stepped up to that uh, as a, a great challenge that it is to help people, and people are finding jobs through the interactions that they're having in their libraries. Mm -hmm. it, I think also libraries have always been a great equalizer. If somebody couldn't afford to buy a book, they could come in and use, and use a book. Right. If someone doesn't have a computer, here's their access to the, to the information highway, right. to the electronic highway. So it's, it's the, the door to let people through into an expanded mm -hmm. universe and, and, and to level the playing field a right. bit so that it, really that, that everyone having opportunity. No, I agree. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm sorry, you were saying, Beverly, it's access and it's also? We provide, libraries provide free access to all the technology, and we teach people how to use the technology. The newest thing coming along the pipe, a library can afford to buy and teach the rest of the community how to use. Oh. <laughs> Some minor technology issues with yeah. the, uh, the audio. Well, that's to be expected. We're used to the glitches, too. Our brains are very good at filling in and the glitches happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> and get, getting better as the technology uh, right. improves, in quotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I just, um, uh, I remember, you know, sort of, you know, as a kid in high school going to the library and, you know, Spending hours looking, you know, trying to figure out the Dewey Decimal System, and you know, and figuring out sort of what shelf my book was on, and then go sitting in, you know, a little room and writing a paper over Christmas vacation and things like that, and uh, you know, sort of, I, I sort of hated and loved it, um, and uh, you know, just as we move paperless, I, so I, you know, part of me laments that you know it won't be quite the same experience, um, but. Uh, but you know, I just you know, from a research perspective, you know, do you, uh, you know, Risa, do you find that um, people are too trusting of what they read on the internet? And I don't mean, oh, you know, like yeah. you know, TMZ.com. But I mean, <laughs> but even you know, if you go to a you know, right. what you believe is a respected source, right? Exactly. If it's online, it must be true, right? right. Not. <laughs> um, but but that's actually that's always been true, even with books. You know, it, it, if it's in the newspaper, it's not necessarily true. The same thing if it's I know shocking, <laughs> shocked, shocked. Um, but it's. Just, in, on, on, in online, all of the online access, it's still so important to use those critical faculties to evaluate what the source is. I mean, if, there, if this it's a lot harder now. It's, it is much harder now. Um, it, but if somebody's telling you the moon is made of green cheese, you know, if they're telling you something about 
current politics, then you look and they're also saying that the moon is made of green cheese and the earth is flat. It really tells you something about what to think about this source. But it is much harder because, it, because there's so, the sources are disparate. And it, it's hard to figure out that's who's right. the author. It really takes some digging and it really takes, that's where part of the critical research faculties or facilities come in. Yeah. Um, and, and this is really one of the great challenges that school librarians face. Mm. Yeah. Um, because they're really responsible for um, developing information literacy skills mm -hmm. uh, in their Absolutely. students. Um, and I don't know, uh, Millie, if you actually see this uh, in the students well, I, at I Framingham teach, State. Yeah, uh, but definitely, I'm sure you, but that's sort of a component when yeah. I teach uh, research. So, but that's so important to um, understand how you can figure out the basic reliability right. of a source. And it yeah. isn't just an online no. skill. I mean, it can be anything, you know, all publications, many publications have a particular slant. You have to be able to read, understand how to figure that out. I have to take that into account um, as you try to make sense of all the different things you read. These are issues that not just people in public libraries or, or even academic libraries, I and mean, Fortune 500 companies face the same, the same issues. Right. Um, and you know, you might be a CEO of, of a new technology company or something. But it's, it's interesting now that, that because a lot of the information is free, and then the um, you know people rely on Wikipedia right. as in terms of fact checking, and so uh, so so sometimes some of the established sources that we rely on haven't done the due diligence. So right. it's a little it's 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 interesting, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But it's also so interesting to be able to teach people to use multiple sources and and see how they either support or don't support each other both with internal consistency and consistency with what external sources say. Um, but again, that's all part of that mm. melding of print and online and... and but, you know, and, and, to, and then to try to make that whole process interesting for students, you know. Yeah. They don't really want to mm. really <laughs> learn that, so <laughs> that's the challenge for us, you know. <laughs> you need a business executive. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, Beverly, did you, did you want to weigh in on, um, on the sort of information veracity? Oh, sorry. Did, did you want to weigh in on uh, sort of, uh, uh, okay, uh, sort of the information truthfulness and sort of uh, we were talking about sort of uh, the validity know, of the sources. Yeah, validity yeah. of sources and that sort of thing. Um, in the sense that you really need a librarian to help you sort that out. Right. I believe firmly in that. That I see too many people, well, students largely, but taking an, the easy way out, the first thing they come to, right. and learning to um, weigh a lot of different sources from a lot of different places and a lot of different voices is really important. You're teaching those kind of skills all along. I, I shouldn't focus on students either. One of the things that a public library you see is across the board. We're, we're dealing with children through seniors, and a lot of, a lot of people inherently believe in what they see on the, elect on the electronic resource and need, need the librarian to help them understand that not everything is, is correct and not, it's not the best place to find the information. Right. It does run across all the age groups. Yeah. But also, I mean, we're not the information gatekeepers, so we have to sort of right. step aside and, you know, and people will figure it out, so they don't necessarily need you know, to be handheld by us. Right, right. You know. pointing in the right direction is right. helpful, but... Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. It's It's teaching them to fish rather than giving them the fish. Yeah. <laughs> so our function so much is the teaching. Yes. We really want to develop people's skills. Uh, we're not um, working ourselves out of a job exactly here. We're we're trying to develop skills amongst all of the people who come in and try to use us for whatever reason. Uh, and you know, and that's the interesting point is sort of the changing role of the librarian. I mean, that's you know, right. as much as it's the same, it, you know, it's also they, there are different skills and you have to keep it's up with them. Different because of the things we were, the tools we're working with, right. the overall gathering, collection, storage, learning how to analyzing, searching. All of those skills are similar. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Um, now, uh, we have a few members, a uh, few people visiting us in the audience. I don't know if we have a mic out there, but I just wanted to take a moment and see um, 
if there were some questions from the audience, uh, we, we're happy to take them. Um, we can just we can just have them. And I don't think we have. Oh, there's not, there's not a mic out there. there. Okay, that's fine. So they can tell them, and you can repeat them. Oh yeah. So if you, if, if you did have a question, I'm happy to repeat the question. Yeah, and we a can comment rather than a question. Oh great. It's, it's more. I don't know how repeatable it is. I'm sort of an outsider because I took a book out of the library after two years of not even using a card mm -hmm. and, uh, and then found how incompatible I was yet again with the library because it takes me too long to read a book. Wow. And I was fined for not bringing it back to renew it, and the second time I still wasn't done, and I had to just bring it back and forget about reading the rest of it. Oh. Uh, um, so was that, is that audible? No. Okay. So, uh, so what the audience member, uh, Glenn, asked is, um, you know, uh, or commented was that, uh, you know, he hadn't used the library in a while and then did take a book out and found that, you know, his own style just led him to reading the book too slowly for the amount of time uh, you know, he had it rented for, and when he went to bring it back, it was fine for, um, you know, uh, for keeping it for too long. Um, and, you know, I wonder about that, the sort of, you know, regardless of whether or not over, you know, over time readership is down or whatever, clearly people are still reading, um, but there are other interruptions in life, and people read at their own pace. Um, I wonder if that's something that's kind of come up in the library circle. I'm sure it has, sort of, how long do you give people to to read a book, and what's the appropriate amount of time? Well, it's kind of an age-old problem, I would say, mm -hmm. um, in that, um, you know, libraries have, typically public libraries have a system of some kind of fines for late return of books. Um, and, you know, uh, the hope is that people will largely be able to return them on time and keep those books moving. That's the reason you have that. But there is a debate in the library profession about whether it's even appropriate to have fines. And there are some libraries that did away with fines entirely, don't have that, so that wouldn't be an impediment. Because what you find is people like Glenn, who have an experience like that, and then they say, well, gee, this isn't really for me. Well, we want it to be for you, just like for everybody else. I so at his shop instead, right. and buy so, the book. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a good option. Right. And, so, you know, what you know, and Glenn is saying that, right, he you know, finds himself going to buy the book because mm -hmm. then it's sort of his for as long as, uh, as you like. And, but right. that's not necessarily so bad. I right. mean, that's I think bad. if no. anything, you know, a lot, I, I read a lot of books, but sometimes I go to the library just to figure out what books I'm going to end up buying. And, you know, so, right. so that's okay. Okay, and it almost underscores the point about delivery methods, mm -hmm. which is that, you know, you know, even if it's still paper, buying the book versus taking it out of the library is just another alternative delivery method. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beverly, did you want to just weigh in on the sort of... Uh, uh, I come from the public library standpoint, right. I feel, I feel like Google to act the library is I've been in the library eight times in the last two years, but I didn't take anything out because there was events there. Right. Yeah. So, so you're saying you visited the library several yeah, times for events and stuff. Yeah, usable to me in a different way because there was a community room and there was a music and, and we consider that real use of the library. We have a, a traffic counter so that, uh, Glenn, you may not have been counted in my circulation statistics, but you were counted at the door when you came in. <laughs> I did. Uh. And those things are important to, to libraries if they're used like that as a, a meeting place, a place to connect. Right, because the library becomes more than a, a, an enormous bookshelf. Exactly. And I think in this time of so much electronic use, which can be isolating, um, you can sit in a cubicle or you can sit in your room and look at your uh, laptop or, your, or things on your mobile device, your phone, whatever. The library becomes a place to gather. Right, and you know, I think 
uh, there's a sensational aspect in, in news and journalism right now about how the book is dying and you know it's over and people aren't and, and people aren't reading and I think that people extrapolate from that that the libraries are also dying and you know no one goes to the library anymore but I think if there's anything we've learned in this conversation is the libraries are more important than ever before and finding new ways to be useful and the patrons are learning about the new ways that the library can be useful, even ways that have been around for so long. You know, people are just now learning about you know uh, how helpful a librarian can be, or the, a subscription to a particular product. Um, so I think we're going to uh, wrap up in just a moment. But I wanted to ask if there are any final comments uh, from any of the panel. Well, I just really wanted to kind of explore the print versus electronic mm -hmm. a little bit more, um, and say that it's really becoming very clear that. People want portability of the materials they read, whether that's audiobooks that you listen to or ebooks that you might read on one of these new, uh, like a Kindle, Kindle or a right. Nook. Um, I think this year there are going to be maybe 10 or a dozen more e readers released, yeah. maybe more than that. Um, so it's pretty clear that we're reaching kind of a critical mass where people are going to really want um, ebooks. Still reading. It's the same text, but it, yes, it'll be a little different experience, and we'll all be watching how that changes the experience. But so I think we're really challenged in libraries to find the right way to provide those materials to our users, um, whether it's on a computer, uh, on a netbook, on their iPhone, however they want to read those materials. And that's really the next, I think, important frontier. Um, and there, you know, there's some paths, but there's no absolutely clear path to that because the whole nature of that technology has to shake out a bit more. But that's something that we're really working toward. Uh, I guess final word, just oh, going sure. back to what you're saying and what everyone's been saying, that really the library has been, is, and probably will always continue to be a gateway to information for people, a center for people to gather and a gateway for dissemination of information in whatever form that takes right. that core aspect mm -hmm. of the library will, will stay the same I agree and Beverly did you want to uh... I wanted to just underscore the relational part of Uh, excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I want to thank the panel, uh, Rob, Risa, Beverly, and Millie. Uh, thanks so much. And we hope you jo you'll join us again on uh, Face the Book. If any viewers would like to join us or if you have questions about independently produced books, writing, publishing, or book selling, please email us at daytripper at piercepress.com, and we'll try to answer them on the show. For information about how you can obtain this show for broadcast in your own community, contact Arlington Community Media at 781-777-1115.